Welcome everyone and thank you for coming to the second session of the Business of Judo. Uh, my name is Grace Toulouse and I own Kokushi Midwest Judo in Champaign, Illinois. Um, I've owned this dojo for about three years. Um, prior to that, I started, I was head coach, head per, oldest person at uh, the Illini Judo Club, which is at the University of Illinois. And I didn't really enjoy my time there, or I did for a little while until it got kind of weird. And so I decided to start my, you know, start my own journey into owning a dojo. And I decided to do that through an Aikido dojo to see if there was any risk involved or if there was a viable uh, way to have judo in Champaign-Urbana. Um, so I did that for about two years and built a, enough of a base that I just, I wanted to start my own dojo and I wanted my own rules, my own way of doing things, my own schedule. So um, after about four or five months of build out and research, I decided to, we opened up our current space. Um, but uh, today I'm going to show you, um, I guess, bring you along on the journey of the initial startup of the dojo. And the key part of that was the, um, the business plan. Um, so that's one of the things we'll be discussing about. We'll go over a quick review of what we did in the last session. Um, we're going to talk about your vision in judo or my vision in judo and how you maybe, I mean, you could use that, um, vision in your, your planning. Uh, we're going to talk about strategic planning and operational planning. Uh, big words, but very simple. I can do it in one slide. I can I can teach you everything in one slide, just like a TikTok video. Um, we'll talk about money, uh, income, and expenses. Where are you going to get capital money, uh, capital startup money, uh, uh, income? How are you going to generate income into the dojo? Your monthly expenses. We'll talk about dojo management software and reaching the community. So uh, through your your website, social media, um, Google, um, e things like that. Um, so in our last episode, we tested the waters and we want to start our own dojo. We've applied for an EIN and opened up a bank account. So EIN is employment insurance number. Uh, it's, it's necessary for taxes and, um, uh, taxes. In, uh, we've incorporated our business. So that means deciding how are you going to be operated, how your business is going to operate as a corporation, a nonprofit, not for profit. Um, I chose the LLC route. Um, it's, it kept, it keeps my, my business, uh, expenses and business money on my, on the business side and my personal family stuff on the other side. So if someone comes after me in, in a lawsuit, uh, my personal assets are protected. We're actively looking into a martial arts insurance because you want to cover your butt accidents that, um, are not related to you know, so if uh, grandma slips and falls in the bathroom uh, and she's not a member of your dojo, what's going to happen if she sues you? What happens if there's a flood or someone throws a brick through the window? What are you going to do? How are you going to cover that? So martial arts insurance uh, covers all of that. We've touched base with an accountant for tax purposes, a lawyer for leases and digital waivers uh, to just to go over things. So you're not, you know, you're not doing something, entering into something that's uh, bad. Uh, and you're also talking with uh, the Small Business Association, which uh, is an invaluable resource for, for, for new businesses that are opening. They, they, they help you with um, how to get started, how to, how to write a business plan, how to network with the other members in your community and other businesses. So I, again, a super valuable uh, resource. Structure and policies is well. another thing we talked about and covered. Uh, we talked about uh, how are you going to structure your organization? Uh, are you going to have a board or a group of members that you make big decisions with? Who's flying the plane and has the final say? Policies are, are the rule of the land. It's your mat, your rules. They set the standard for behavior control so that your club can run in a cohesive and consistent manner. Uh, good policies allow for good decision making, objectivity, and accountability. Oops, sorry, I went too fast. You also have your coaching credentials down. I that's in the previous slide, coaching credentials down from the USJF uh, Teachers Institute or um, IJF Academy. So no matter how many medals you have, you have to be, a, you know, it doesn't mean you necessarily translate to being a good coach. You need your CPR um, certification because again, if grandma has a heart attack on the side of the mat, what are you going to do? Um, you have your heads up, safe sport. Uh, heads up is concussion recognition, safe sport. Creepy people exist out there. So you, you really do need um, that certification down. And it's, of course, your USJF uh, club registration. Um, 
So our first plan of attack is the business plan. What is a business plan? Um, this is a document that, that you, you write and you compile after a lot of thought um, into, um, it, it's a, a document that you use to uh, write your goals down, lay out your strategy. It's a step-by-step -step guide that helps you through each stage of your business, business. And if you're applying for grants or looking for business partners, you'll need to present a cohesive document that shows people that you're a good investment and someone that they'll wanna work with. Um, it convinces people that you know what you're talking about and what direction you're going. And once you have it, you can refer back to it at any point in case you need to adjust your plan of attack or reevaluate any initial strategies. Um, a business plan helps you set your goals. And just as Jimmy Pedro's well-known mantra, a goal set is a goal met. Um, so you lay out your goals. You know what you want. You're going to go get it. Seven main components of a business plan. Uh, the one I wrote for the dojo is more than, was more than 32 pages long, and I still refer to it often. Um, I, I did need this to, to, uh, to apply for a grant, and it was a long process and a hard process, and a lot of thought went into it, but I'm so glad I did it because I can still refer to it every day if I need to uh, you know, think of something. I have to put together a three- to four-year-old program, and that was one of the components in my business plan, and I haven't used it for about three years, but now I'm getting a lot of inquiries about uh, three and four-year-olds, so I'm going to start implement a, a three to four-year-old program. Um, you do need a business description. So this is detailed information of your dojo, you as a dojo owner and the problems that you're going to solve and explains why you are the best place for judo. Uh, market analysis, who's your competition? Identify their weaknesses and your strengths within the judo community. Uh, is there someone, is there a dojo that you want to be like and bring that, Bring the good stuff into the into your program and your dojo. Um, market analysis also includes, uh, you know, who you can actively actively compete with. So not only martial arts, taekw you know, taekwondo, uh, jujitsu, karate, aikido, uh, sports programs like football, gymnastics, swimming. You're going to compete with all of them. So you want to figure out what their what problems they're solving and how well they're doing it and how you can make it better. Objectives, short and long-term goals. How many students do you want to start with? Where do you want to go? So you have short-term, which is one year, and long-term, which is three to five years. So three to, or sorry, five to ten years. So where do you want, where do you see yourself and your dojo in five to ten years? Do you want to have like a eight-hour day program? Do you want to have a hundred students on the mat? Do you want to be running like two classes simultaneously? Are you going to be in a different venue? Uh, maybe you've grown too big for the mat and you just want to expand. So this implements everything and you know, it, it, you've written everything out. Um, organization and management. Oh, wait, I, I skipped marketing and sales. Marketing, how are you gonna reach people in the community and how are you gonna get them on the mat? It's an ongoing evolution of, of who you're marketing to. So my, mine has changed over the years. I just wanted judo at first, but now I'm sort of going for character development. Um, we'll get into that later. Organization and management. Who flies the plane? We've talked we talked about this a little bit earlier in last session. Um, how are you going to govern your organization? How are you going to like lead so that others will follow you? Um, and you uh, find people that that are are good to, are good people and who will be loyal to you and figure out where they fit best in your dojo. So if someone might be good at accounting, you can put them, you know, in tr as treasurer, or someone's good at coaching, you put them as, uh, you know head coach and have the little assistant instructors. Um, you can build a lot of, you know, great people within, within your organization. Um, financials, uh, you're gonna have to write down your, um, if you have any financial reports, past financial reports, or if you don't, um, just, you sort of like, it's guesswork, you, you, you know, you have a good idea of who your, you know, your students are, how much are you gonna charge per month? How much are you gonna, um, how much income you're gonna bring in? How much are you are gonna pay in taxes? what your monthly uh, monthly expenses are and what your capital expenses are and what your projections are like for the year or for, you know, like five years down the road. Are you going to like, you know, break even, you know, like three years down the road? Or are you going to break even right away? Or are you going to be in profit right away? And then finally is like it, you put together an executive summary. So this is kind of like your the summary of your thesis. So you don't go and write a thesis and just, you know, say what you're going to, you know, summarize everything. You sort of have to write everything down first, and then you write, you do your summary at the beginning, at the end of it, and then you copy and paste it and put it at the top. So people know what 
what what you want in a very like condensed version rather than the 32 page version of your uh, business plan. So uh, executive summary just tells you, you know, a brief synopsis of your business. So um, your business description and your target market. So you have to figure out what your vision is for, for your dojo. Why should someone train judo? And how are you going to convey your passion to the consumer? Um, my vision ch has changed dramatically since uh, I started. I, want, I just wanted judo. Um, I just wanted to show people, you know, this is such a cool mar uh, sport, martial art. Um, but I couldn't just convey that uh, to, to my followers because they already knew what judo was. So I had to convey that to uh, the young families within my market. And I had to um, figure out what all the other, the competition was and you know what they were marketing to. So people buy, you know, they're not gonna come in and say like, I wanna do judo. They don't even know what judo is. So you gotta figure out what they want. You have to solve a problem and you gotta figure out what their problem is. So. Um, I'm going to show you in the next slide a, uh, a, a very short video. It's five minutes long and it's by Simon Sinek. And he is a business guru and marketing exec, but he does all these uh, really cool TED Talks and he, he writes all these cool podcasts or talk, does, does all these really neat podcasts and very insightful of what um, it takes to market to someone and have uh, be a good leader. So this helps you. This, he's talking about this in a business context but it easily translates into a, uh, into a judo organization. So five minutes, uh, listen, I guess. And I think you can share, I think, I'm hoping there's sound. I call it the golden circle. Why, how, what? This little idea explains why some organizations and some leaders are able to inspire where others aren't. Let me define the terms really quickly. Every single person, every single organization on the planet knows what they do 100%. Some know how they do it, whether you call it your differentiating value proposition or your proprietary process or your USP, but very, very few people or organizations know why they do what they do. And by why, I don't mean to make a profit. That's a result. It's always a result. By why, I mean what's your purpose, what's your cause, what's your belief? Why does your organization exist? Why do you get out of bed in the morning? And why should anyone care? Well, as a result, the way we think, the way we act, the way we communicate is from the outside in. It's obvious. We go from the clearest thing to the fuzziest thing. But the inspired leaders and the inspire or inspired organizations, regardless of their size, regardless of their industry, all think, act, and communicate from the inside out. Let me give you an example. I use Apple because they're easy to understand and everybody gets it. If Apple were like everyone else, a marketing message from them might sound like this. We make great computers. They're beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. Want to buy one? Meh. And that's how most of us communicate. That's how most marketing is done, that's how most sales is done, and that's how most of us communicate interpersonally. We say what we do, we say how we're different or how we're better, and we expect some sort of behavior, a purchase, a vote, something like that. Here's our new law firm. Uh, we have the best lawyers with the biggest clients. We have, you know, we always perform for our clients, do business with us. Here's our new car. It gets great gas mileage. It has, you know, leather seats. Buy our car. But it's uninspiring. Here's how Apple actually communicates. Everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in thinking differently. The way we challenge the status quo is by making our products beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. We just happen to make great computers. Want to buy one? Totally different, right? You're ready to buy a computer from me. All I did was reverse the order of the information. What it proves to us is that people don't buy what you do, people buy why you do it. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. This explains why every single person in this room is perfectly comfortable buying a computer from Apple. 
but we're also perfectly comfortable buying an MP3 player from Apple, or a phone from Apple, or a DVR from Apple. But as I said before, Apple's just a computer company. There's nothing that distinguishes them structurally from any of their competitors. Their competitors are all equally qualified to make all of these products. In fact, they tried. A few years ago, Gateway came out with flat screen TVs. They're eminently qualified to make flat screen TVs. They've been making flat screen monitors for years. Nobody bought one. And Dell. Dell came out with MP3 players and PDAs. And they make great quality products, and they can make perfectly well-designed products, and nobody bought one. In fact, talking about it now, we can't even imagine buying an MP3 player from Dell. Why would you buy an MP3 player from a computer company? But we do it every day. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. When we communicate from the outside in, yes, people can understand vast amounts of complicated information like features and benefits and facts and figures. It just doesn't drive behavior. When we communicate from the inside out, we're talking directly to the part of the brain that controls behavior, and then we allow people to rationalize it with the tangible things we say and do. This is where gut decisions come from. You know, sometimes you can give somebody all the facts and your figures, and they say, I know what all the facts and details say, but it just doesn't feel right. Why would we use that verb? It doesn't feel right. Because the part of the brain that controls decision making doesn't control language. And the best we can muster up is, I don't know, it just doesn't feel right. Or sometimes you say you're leading with your heart or you're leading with your soul. Well, I hate to break it to you, those aren't other body parts controlling your behavior. It's all happening here in your limbic brain, the part of the brain that controls decision making and not language. But if you don't know why you do what you do, and people respond to why you do what you do, then how will anybody how will you ever get people to, 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 to vote for you or buy something from you, or more importantly, be loyal? All right, so what is Judah's why? Um, I've, I struggled with this. I didn't, um, at first, I just wanted them to do judo because, I mean, look at all the Olympic champions we have, look at all, um, you know, it's a great way to get in shape. I, you know, and just throw, 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 throw. I love throwing. I love name walls. I love everything about judo. But I couldn't figure out what the why was until um, recently when, when I did uh, a judo demonstration in the park and I had students out in the audience and they were sort of like handing out flyers and because they couldn't, they were like either injured or whatever. But we wound up breaking the stage that day because we were doing all of these crazy throws. Then no one's ever the 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 feeling within the audience was like that's too violent i why would i do that um so i started reevaluating re what what i was doing and uh for me as a parent to to two small kids um why what apart from getting them out of the house and you know giving me a you know a half hour break a, a one hour break um i wanted when i was picking activities for them because they were still too young to do judo at three years old from uh, my program um, I had to figure out what I wanted, what would make me go to someone's program. And so I came up, um, with, with a little bit of, you know, as a parent, I want my kid to be happy, to be kind, to be healthy, to be, res uh, respectful, to be happy and safe, to have fun and to have friends. Um, these are pillars to being to be to create you know good solid children good you know good character within their children and that's in, in children and that's um all i wanted for my kids at that point so whether it was swimming or whatever but in this case these these are pillars to creating good contributing members of society and these kids just happen to do judo um with, for adults same same thing adults have goals um and you know, no matter how big or how small these goals are, they all they all have they're all working for something. They're all looking for something you know fulfilling. So, adults want to be fit, they want to be healthy, they want to have friends, they want to have fun, and they want to learn something new and be challenged. Um, so, all all adults have these goals. And you know, Jimmy Pedro says a goal set is a goal met, and they work hard every day to attain these goals. And ad these adults will do judo. And for me, my goals and my vision shared uh, helped me figure out what the purpose of the dojo was, and that was to build good people and good character through judo. Uh, not just teaching them judo to build good character, but using using these good characters through judo. Um, and ultimately, the goal is to grow the dojo in Champaign, and so that everyone knows that 
I teach judo and Kokushi Midwest Judo is where they do judo. Um, and so I've switched that. I've, I've made this the statement and, and I'm getting more people in rather than, oh, that's too scary. I don't want my kid to do judo because it's, it's, it's dangerous because that's, that, that's the, the, con the common perception of judo. Um, so you could argue that um, all these traits and goals can translate into sports across the board, like from football to gymnastics, uh, wrestling, tennis, uh, even, you know, piano lessons. But uh, these are core, the core values that um, Jigoro Kano saw so many years ago and when he created the Judo Moral Code. And, and anytime I go to um, dojo, visit dojos, there are only a handful where you feel that, you know, this, there's a spirit within the dojo that, that emulates that you don't find in a lot of dojos. But, you know, like uh, when I visited uh, Koga's dojo, it was, that, it was that same vibe. It was like everyone loved being there, loved having fun, but they were doing Judo. And um, there are, you know, in the handful of dojos within the U.S. that I visited anyways, like uh, uh, Sensei Fukuda's dojo in San Francisco is a perfect example. It's like this, this helpfulness and this spirit and just to build a good, per uh, good people. And, and you build good, good people and the judo is just the result of it. Um, so, um, so, and Jigoro kind of wanted like, you know, ju judo players to just uphold this code on and off the mat. And I, I even talked to like when we were in IJF Academy that at the after party, and I was talking with uh, Daniel Lasko about um, opening a dojo and all the troubles that I was having with attracting new students. And he just said, think of the moral code of judo. Um, that's that's what they want. You can't get that in wrestling. You can't get that in jujitsu. Although you could, I mean, you could argue it. But uh, Jigoro Kano had this vision so long ago, and he knew that's what he wanted in judo. So that's what I'm trying to project to the community. And so far, it's working. Um, people seem to enjoy coming to the dojo, and the kids leave having fun. It's not how many osotogaris we do during the class. It's just being together, having fun, and socializing. Um, so once you have this vision you're going to put it into operational plans and strategic planning. So my vision was, you know, this is my vision. So I'm going to put it on paper and this is how I'm going to accomplish it. Accomplish it. So the operational plans are just your short term day to day operations. And you just like Monday, I do this Tuesday, I do this Wednesday, I do this Thursday, I do this. So exactly what we were talked to before, how many students do you want? What's your goal in a month? How many students are going to grow per month? Um, how many, st I mean, how many classes are you going to run per week? Uh, how, what are your goals after the first month? Do you want to grow your dojo by three students per month, five students, 10 students? Um, it's up to you, um, but you just come back and, and adjust it and then you can sort of um, build that. So you have your month and then you'll have your year and then eventually you'll have your five year and 10 years. So your, your long term goal is, you know, what direction are you going to bring your, your dojo in. Are you gonna go for the competition strategy, the competition route, the recreational route, somewhere like right in the middle? Um, uh, where do you see your program going in five to 10 years? Do you want a national training center um, kind of vibe? Um, you can even take a, a pad of post-it notes and find a blank wall and just start, you know, writing, writing a class down. I'm gonna have a kid's class at 3.30 and I'm gonna have a class, you know, advanced kid's class at five o'clock and I'm gonna have an adult's class at six o'clock. So that's three hours of work or you know however long your classes are and then you can times that by seven you can build your you know one week plan two week block of you know curriculum and a one week one month uh thing of you know curriculum and you'll just build it so you can look at it into uh as uh you know your operational plans are a lego block and you build upon these lego blocks you put all these lego blocks together and eventually you're gonna have something really cool like you know that and but that might be you know like advanced lego building master builder so that's probably your national training center your six branches of it with your face and statue in front um so your operate your strategical plan right now would probably more look more like that okay so that's operational and strategic plan planning in a nutshell uh financial planning um so this is another thing, an important aspect. Uh, you might have to just make some of this up, but you know, with, with numbers and like how much you're gonna charge per month, your, what your expenses are, but you do have to, to write it down and show so, be able to show someone what you think things are gonna cost. Um, you're gonna try and figure out how, how much money you need to start up. Um, so with your, all your licenses, your you know, rent, your you know, 
first last month deposit, um, you know, accountants. I mean, everything you can think of like mats, water fountains. Um, you you want to lay down, um, you know, budget for a very professional looking dojo. You can't just open it up in your friend's garage and put, you know, old wrestling mats on the, you know, concrete. That's not going to do anything for judo. So you want to put within your budget, you want to put as, a, you know, the best foot forward. Um, uh, let's see. I'm going to leave income for last, I think. Um, so you're also going to put, you know, sort of start thinking about your income and what, what you're going to charge for, you know, per student, per family. And then you're going to project for one year, three to three to five years, 10 years. So, it, you know, income minus expenses, are you going to be in a profit or a loss? Um, and then you can, you know, build like Excel spreadsheets, you know, do bar graphs, pie charts, whatever. The more professional you're, it's on paper, um, then you can have a realistic idea of what, um, what you're dealing with. Um, income. So I've been asked to talk about um, charging dues for for judo. Um, so this is a you know hot and cold topic. I came from an Aikido dojo where it was nonprofit, and it was um, not ideal because they they were charging like basically pennies to train, and I don't think it did much for the for the dojo because it was just I, I had to pay in to be a volunteer. And uh, I pay dues to the dojo. I volunteer to do to teach judo three nights a week, and whatever the market cap, what the family cap was. So I paid I think forty dollars a month, and then the family cap was fifty dollars. So if you had a group of ten kids come in, or a family of ten kids, they all trained for a nominal fifty dollars. So I did the math one day, and it wound up being like two cents a class or something, and it was. Uh, I, I, I started getting like a little frosty because I had to, I was basically paying more to teach them. I was paying to teach them judo and they, they just viewed it as free babysitting. So I didn't want that. And so I decided to go and start the dojo and I charged a hundred dollars and all my players followed me over and they had no problem chart, you know, you know, upping the fee cause they, they could train whenever they want. We had a, a good schedule that we could, um, adhere to and it was more ideal hours and they saw the sprung mats that we had um because we like big you know nice sprung floor bound almost like a bouncy castle in there and you know i didn't have to water down the judo because as soon as someone hit the mat at the aikido dojo they were out the door because it was like there was no it was like a big bang and there was no there's no give and everyone you know all the new people uh barely lasted a week so um I say, you know, and then I, I, you know, I put a lot of work into building the dojo. And so I wanted uh, to charge for my expertise and what the, the judo players that were studying with me, it was, it was, um, I was paying for, you know, a nice facility to work in. So I don't view them as paying me to do judo, but more about contributing to the pot every month to keep the doors open. Um, I also think that um, I do love judo. I love judo so much that um, I'm at the point where I can't believe I'm being paid to teach it. And then there's are other people who think that, um, who go the route of, I love judo so much, I'll teach it for free. But that, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a fine line, but I think that um, charging uh, a, a good amount where it covers the expenses for the month and it covers um, it allows me to, you know, get extra mats or crash mats at the end of the, the day and puts value on the sport. I think um, it's it's better. Um, and then there are people who say that, um, you know, well, I don't I don't need judo. You know, I think judo should be accessible to everyone. And I, I believe that's true, too. But um, I think um, and, and they also say that, you know, they don't really need the money or the dojo doesn't need the money. But I think that you could also do, do a lot of good if you if you put that that money, that extra income to good use. And, you know, it, it, it you can grow, you can offer, you know, donate, you know, profits to a food bank that would help the community out. And it's not just for judo, it's for the community. And or you can, you know, help send a kid to camp for, a, you know, a summer or, you know, even bigger things if you want. But I think that charging more for your charging for your expertise because you know lawyer you don't you I have lawyer friends or doctor friends I don't go up to them and say hey can you can you look at this for you know I, I don't know what it is can you look at it and can you treat it so I, I go you know through the proper channels and 
pay whatever's necessary to 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 for their expertise. Um, and then also uh, finding um, a, a part of the 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 um, marketing or figuring out who your target market is and who your competition is is important because there's. Um, I have a, a good friend who, who's about two streets down from the dojo, and he runs a uh, a, a gymnastics academy. And he said, you know, he charges one hundred and twenty dollars for once a week for eight eight weeks, I think, or no, sorry, uh, for one for five weeks. And he said that that I should be, you know, find exactly the similar things like after school programs, kids programs, and parents are willing to pay for their students to have the best, and it's a perception of value. So you know, he's he. He, he's one of the more expensive places in town for gymnastics, but people are willing to pay for, for what they think is quality. And they're not in the greatest building, but they do have the mats, they have the sprung floor, they have huge facilities and people are willing to pay for it. And so I believe that I have one of the better judo facilities in the area and one of the better martial arts facilities in the area. So I will, I charge accordingly. I charge, I charge $125 and people have no problem paying for it. Um, cause they see value in, in the dojo, the sprung floor, the mats, the cleanliness, cleanliness and the, the good part of town. So they're willing to pay. And I've had very little resistance on it. Um, so essential piece of equipment for your dojo is a computer. And in the next uh, couple of slides, we're going to be talking about, uh, websites, dojo management, software, and social media, you know, all these aspects to get your the word out to the community. Um, again, figure out who your targeted consumer is and, and target market is. And like I said, it's, it, this is business plan is very repetitive. It's just like rewording the same thing into the marketing aspect or the financial aspect. Um, figure out who your competition is, uh, and actively, actively compete with them. And we just talked about that. Um, you have to get the word out that you're open for business and serve a purpose within the community. So if you're going to charge a lot, you know, and you don't need it, you know, you know, peel off a little of that, uh, of, of that profit and, you know, do some good with it. Um, and you have to, you know, um, put your message out there and your vision and then, you know, get those people into the dojo and onto your mat. Um, reaching the community with a website. You're going to need a great website that works for you. Um, it's an important part of your business. Um, and it's a big part of your marketing and your day-to-day uh, -day operations. And it's not just going onto Wix and creating a free website, which does nothing for you. Um, if possible, you, uh, invest a little bit of money uh, and get into a professional website built so it works for you. Um, you have to have it search engine optimized. So that means you you populate your, your um, pages with, with like buzzwords that Google picks up on. So, uh, and it, it's not just judo, it's martial arts, kids programs, kids sports, sports, adult sports, adult martial arts, community, safety, family. I mean, those are all buzzwords that, that people are looking for on Google. And uh, Google, if you're, you're, you have a website that, that's, that's with uh, search engine optimization tools, it, it really does help. Um, it gets your, your rankings up on Google. So the search engine optimization is another word for getting your Google, your rankings up on Google. Um, because like everyone searches on Google for, you know, if I'm looking for a program for my kids, it's I'm either searching for kids martial arts or kids sports or after school programs or toddler programs, um, whatever you want, but you need to have those buzzwords within your, your, your website. So Google picks up on it. Um, uh, and, and we can argue all day. I mean, there are people who think, you know, judo is either a martial arts or, or a sport, which is, you know, two sides of the, two sides of the, the, the coin. Um, I, I would market to both and because you, you want to cast a wide net across, you know, cast a wide net out there and see who comes in. Cause most people don't know what judo is and most people don't know who J Jigoro Kano is. So you want your, your, your homepage to be populated with buzzwords, pictures of happy, smiling kids and geese. And, you know, parents want that for their kids. Um, be sure to set up a Google business account and for, and reviews. So, um, 
I, I use Google Business very, not very um, often, but I do have it just so that, you know, when you Google picks, you know, um, you're searching how to get to, you know, Kokushi Midwest, it, it shows up on Google and Google Maps. And um, I guess it's useful for that, but I mean, I haven't used it that often, but it is an important part. Um, but some places will automatically do it for you. And then um, Google Ads uh, are another thing which I'm not completely familiar on, but I found that I, I did put a lot of money into Google Ads when I first started, and it, it doesn't bring much in because they're like, you know, the McDonald's right across the street, you know, puts in more money into Google Ads. And, you know, Google will like prioritize McDonald's business as opposed to mine. So I haven't used Google Ads that much, but. Uh, Google business is an important thing and then it allows also allows people to leave Google reviews and that also helps boost your ratings up on um, Google and if also if I if I'm you know marketing to uh, martial arts dojos or and sports uh, I can comp uh, my Google is competing with those other um, event those other businesses so um, if you look up Kokushi Midwest on Google you'll see that I'm number four in Champaign for uh, martial arts. There's like, there's three really like big Taekwondo places that are above me and they're like four or 500 students, but I'm at least com being able to compete with them with my search engine optimized website. And then also if your website allows for a blog, you can blog as well. And that allows, that forces uh, Google to come back and search and, re and review your content if there's new content being put, put out. Um, and you don't have to blog, you don't have to do any of these long, like long winded blog posts, but you can just do something as simple as, you know, student of the month, uh, you know, what your plan, what are your plans for bully prevention month? What about, uh, uh, you know, new IJF rules? You can make it as long or involved as you want. But, you know, Google, all this Google stuff is very important and having a search engine optimized website is super important. And there are three main um, companies that, that do this. So it's Website Dojo, 97 Display, and Market Muscles. Those are the three main ones. Um, I actually, I use 97 Display personally. Um, they're great. Uh, Website Dojo, I think is number one in, in, the, in the country in terms of uh, martial arts websites. And Market Muscles, that's the one that Jimmy Pedro uses. They're, they're also great too. And they're all um, search engine optimized websites. And it does cost a little bit of money to, um, to get your website up and going, but it, it it's worth it. And it's, you know, just, you know, you can work that cost into your uh, monthly dues. Um, dojo management software. So uh, another way to reach the community is through emails. And this dojo management software is like a time saver, a lifesaver. It gives you hours back in, into your day. You don't have to sit there and reconcile with books or, you know, you know, you've, you know, let things sort of slide or pile up in the in the back room and all of a sudden you have like three months of paperwork and administrative work to, to uh, catch up on. So this saves, saves time. Um, like how many times have you had a student come in and say, hey, you know, and you're, you know, three months, you know, three months behind on your, on your dues, can you pay up? And he's like, oh yeah, I forgot. I'll pay you next time. And then he's on there for that session and then you don't see him again for like three months. So that's lost income. Um, uh, dojo management software allows you to keep credit cards on file and automatic, it automatically charges the credit card or it sends them an invoice and it go, it does all the dirty work for you. It, it sends, uh, thing, emails saying that your credit card is about to expire, updated. Oh, your credit card got object, uh, rejected. What's wrong? Can you, can you, um, update it? Um, it takes care of takes care of uh, payment processing at you know for merchandise uh, events testing. Um, it tracks attendance. It tracks progression. Um, it tracks. It sends out automated responses. It sends out email reminders and text reminders that uh, don't forget about your class or hey we haven't seen you in a week where are you. It allows uh, within the for the pandemic it allows my members they have an app and it allows members to book their spot on the mat. And it also takes care of takes cares of uh, all the new member signups. So everything is digital. I don't I don't have to deal with paper. Everything's automatic, and it's just um, digital signups and waivers are are taken care of. And um, 
at the end of the year, if I need, you know, my tax reports, you know, or expense reports, any kind of reports, I just hit a button and it, I, I, the printer shoots it out. So this is a lifesaver and it, it goes, that's just like the surface of it. There's so much more it does, but um, the main one I use, I've used a bunch of them. So Spark is the one that I use. Um, it's not a paid endorsement or anything, but I, this, this, this one's great. I've used Mind body that was that was okay. I, I wasn't crazy about the customer service. I'm not knocking it or not anything. Zen Planner was also good. It, that was about um, all these things cost about between $100 and $200 a month. So again, you're gonna have to build that um, cost into your your due, monthly dues. Um, but I highly recommend doing all this, and it does send out emails and text reminders. Anyone who's attended a, a Nihon no Sensei or a Mass Sensei with me, I've uh, it sends out emails and it sends out, uh, it, it categorizes, categorizes everyone um, accordingly. So if they've attended a kata clinic, I know to send my next kata clinic emails out to them. If, it, if they did a, a workout uh, with either the mass sensei, the Nihon no sensei, it's categorized out and it automatically sends reminders. Hey, we have this clinic coming up. Do you want to join in? Here's the link. Um, and so... Uh, it also uh, it categorizes your your current students, your former students, parents, uh, someone who went to summer clinic. I mean, it does everything. It's kind of like, I mean, it's like your butler at the dojo. Um, another way to reach the community, you've done email, we've done the website, and now we go through social media. Um, I found out recently that. Um, if you post on TikTok or Instagram first, it will automatically link to your Twitter and Facebook, which I find convenient because I'll go Facebook first and then I'll have to repost onto Twitter myself and repost onto Instagram myself. But I found out if you go TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, it automatic it, it does everything for you. And I think that's, I mean, it's fun. And it does reach out, reach to the community. Um, and people are coming in saying, hey, I saw your TikTok video or the kids at school, you know, they'll come. And say, hey, can we do a TikTok? Because you know my friend really liked it, and they want to come in because they want to be on TikTok. And you know that's not the core of my program, but you know we do that if we have you know five minutes before class. So um, if you don't know what TikTok, I mean, social media has all these different you know derivatives of what what they do and how to get your word out uh, for businesses or yourself. Um, the sky's the limit with with TikTok. It's you can sit there and and learn how to make pasta in 10 seconds or you know dance along with a celebrity or do a fitness challenge but you can also use it to promote your business um i've used this this video that i'm about to show is a little bit loud but it's only 15 seconds but i've made it fun and the kids i mean enjoyed doing it um you may have seen it already but um i'm going to show it to you anyway so it's the first note is really loud so i apologize <laughs> So it loops. So that's why it cut off, but it's going to loop right back to the beginning. And it's incessant and it's annoying, but it makes something, you know, it shows kids having fun, kids at judo. And we're not, the, I, don't, I purposely don't show kids being thrown because parents don't want to see that. Because, you know, they're like, oh, it's too violent. But, you know, um, because they don't, obviously they don't know what judo is yet. But if you do something silly, silly like this, they'll bring, you know, friends will come in and say, hey, I want to, you know, I want to do that. Can we, can we get in on it? And I usually say, you know, after two weeks, I'll be like, we have to do the unit first. And then if you're really good, then we'll do a TikTok. So that's the reward. Um, so you have to make your TikToks fun. And then it automatically, again, posts to Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, and then you, just, you always have to link to your website. So um whatever any post that you do you have to say you know kids are having fun come to judo kokushimidwest.com and then they can actively click on your 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 site um you also have to put in hashtags if you don't know what hashtags are um this kind of if you put in hashtag judo it it puts your your post into anything that someone searches for judo 
So hashtag judo, I put hashtag fun, hashtag kids sports, hashtag martial arts, hashtag champagne, because that's where I live, and that's the city, hashtag Shambana, that's the nickname for Champagne Urbana. So anyone looking for judo in Champagne or Urbana, or they're looking for kids sports or martial arts, they can see that we're on TikTok and we're having fun, okay? And then if you're doing an event or anything actually on Facebook, or you think it's kind of uh, silly, I mean, the best thing you can do for your colleagues who are trying to do something for judo is to just share it. Um, it's better, it's just as good as attending the event that, that you're going to. So, um, and I do appreciate anyone who shared any events that I've done in the last while. But um, these are important ways to reach your market, your 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 um, market within your community, your um, all the parents, all the families that are looking for some, something for their kids to do. Um, next thing, reaching the community in person. So when you're first starting up or actually any chance that you get, there's an opportunity that comes up to showcase your business, you need to do it. Um, you may be throwing money out the window because I, I, you know, I've done a lot of um, demonstrations for, for Japan House, which is a, a, a thing at the University of Illinois and they have these beautiful um, cherry blossoms every year and it's a, a very Japanese, um, cultural center and I don't think I've ever pulled in anything but it's a lot of fun and you know uh, th they'll always showcase us during any of their their events or their demonstrations but I getting my name out and now everyone at Japan House knows oh you you do judo are uh, you doing it with Grace at, at Kakushi and so all of this stuff gets your name your face out into the community so demonstrations parades um, um, when when school's out for kids you want to think about doing camps um, that also, you know, time, you know, gives parents a break because they don't know what to do with their kids. Birthday parties obviously brings in um, outside kids. So all the, the kids in your dojo, they're going to bring in their friends to celebrate their birthday. And yeah, you know, make a policy that you don't have cake on the mat. Um, bring a friend day is also another great way to get the word out that you're there. Um, if you have any local websites, family websites or e-magazines that are local, uh, get just get your face out there. Just, you know, right now we have a, a local uh, uh, website that are called Shambana Moms and they're saying like, showcase your event, showcase your dojo or showcase your business in the comments. And so I'll link to here to, to, to the dojo. And I'm getting, that's why I'm getting a lot of three and four year old inquiries. Um, sponsorships looking to, I don't know, sponsor a, a little kid's softball league or a, a, a a yearbook ad in your kid's school, uh, provide a scholarship. So if you're, if you're one of those people who um, don't need the money for your dojo, but just charge a little bit of money and then, you know, use those profits again to, to create an opportunity for another another uh, kid to do something within the community, like whatever, a camp or a, you know, sponsor them to come into the dojo or, you know, go, you know, whatever, uh, a 4-H camp. So all these things are, are good for your marketing plan and your, your community outreach and how you're going to get your, the, your business out there. So you also have to just, these are just things you just have to write down and put into your business plan and give someone, you'll be able to present something very meaty to, to your you know, investors or partners. Uh, oh, here we go. So I guess this is, this is sort of like the end of the, the presentation. And I just want to thank you all and just tie everything up. So with your business plan, it's just your goals. All you're doing is strategically, systematically writing your goals down. Um, uh, it helps, you know, it's gonna help you with your business and because you, so you always have something to, to refer to and you're, you always have something, uh, some sort of like, you know, if you don't know what to do or you're feeling panicked about, you know, well, no one's coming and what do I do? You always have this document that you can just uh, look at and refer to and you're just, and it kind of calms you down and says, oh, I, it, you've got this. So, so it's just like, visualize what you want to do before you do it and then when you know what you want and how to do it it's only a matter of time until you get it so i mean that's basically what a business plan is it just it lays everything out for you so thank you for your time uh ooh, that was a long one but uh 51 minutes but anyways this is time for open discussion i'm here to listen please go easy on me grace i have a question Yes. Hi, Dan. Yay. Um, so, Grace, you're not doing this full time? I am doing this full time. You are doing this full time. So what were you doing before you started your dojo? Um, 
I was teaching, I was, so we moved out here um, in 2005. And before that, I was, I was working at a, a music school. I had just started a job at a music school as, as marketing manager and, and communications manager. So I was doing a lot of that. And prior to that, I was working at uh, WBGO in um, New Jersey. So that's a jazz station on the East Coast. And I was, again, in charge of marketing and, and management there. I'm curious, one of the things you make a point of is that, you know, you're, you, you try to explain how you're trying to keep your prices low and, you know, you want to use all your money that goes back. What's wrong with making money yourself, making it, you know, profitable for yourself? I mean, it's, that doesn't seem to be your goal at all. I, it's, it's my part, my prices are actually like $125. It's, it's sort of a lot for judo. I mean, there are dojos around here that are charging like, like, uh, Forty, fifty dollars at the. Why do you compare yourself to judo and you don't compare yourself to BJJ or to ballet? I'm competing. I'm actually. Activity? I'm I'm on the same price level as all the the ballet schools, the art schools here. Okay. Uh, all right. So my goal, my goal, my goal isn't actually to make a profit in this. I mean, it is. I mean, it's a result. I love. I mean, I don't. I don't mind. I my doors are open, and it's not a big. It's not a big priority to me for to make money in in judo it it helps but it's not my ultimate i mean it'd be nice but you have to survive i mean you have to live i do but i'm we're we're in the situation where we don't we don't i mean i my i don't it's not going to put my, uh, food on my table so we're well, i'm we're i'm fortunate to be in this situation where i don't have to it's not going to you know if if that mats are empty i can still pay the rent because okay. the cost of living in Champagne is actually very low. If I could, if, uh, this is Chuck, if I could interrupt, uh, Dan, uh, I've spoken with Grace about this a number of times, and she is very, very vigorously supportive of, of uh, we, um, well, of us um, um, showing, uh, being paid for our expertise. We've been doing this for a long time, all of us. And uh, yeah, um, I think that most of the people on this call, I won't guess at all. There's probably a lot of people on the call that agree with you completely. I do. Uh, I remember a few years ago at a strategic planning meeting, one of the senseis from, or the older senseis from Hawaii got up in front of us and said, if we don't monetize judo, we're dead. And Grace has also made the point, uh, she made, I think it was last time, and she's made the point to me uh, that if we don't have a place for judokas to go, that is to open their clubs, to be, become assistant uh, instructors, make money out of it, become head instructors, earn your own or uh, own your own dojo, then our sport will continue to be a, a cottage industry. And we're better than that. So um, I don't think that, that Grace was implying that we should be cheap. Uh, she's, at the, she's at the level of uh, uh, the, the other levels that uh, are in Champaign. But I and Grace and I'm sure a lot of people uh, agree completely with you. We we should be pricing ourselves like we value, uh, so that the people, the people of America, value something that's expensive, whether that's right or not. Uh, that's what they do, and so we we shouldn't be cheap. Uh, let me also say that when that if you all look at the reactions button at the bottom of your screen, when you have a question, please go to reactions and and hit the raise hand. Button. That way, uh, uh, Grace will be able to find out who's asking a question, and uh, you can stay in order. Uh, Grace, back to you. So, getting back to I, if we lived in a place where people would be willing to pay three hundred dollars a month for judo, I would charge that easily. Okay. I, I would. I would not have any qualms about it. But one hundred and twenty dollars is is the going rate here. If I go up to like one hundred and seventy, I would really outprice myself. I understand. I understand. Thank you very much. Sixty dollars, I think, is too cheap. Hundred, hundred dollars, hundred twenty-five dollars is right where we are. What range we're in? But okay. I would have no problem charging three hundred dollars. Thank you very much, and I, I apologize if I jumped out of line there. At my, um, thank you. Hey, Mickey's, uh, Mickey's got her hand up. Mickey Takamori. Hi. I just wanted to reiterate what Chuck was saying that we devalue. Um, what uh, are, are uh, there are numerous, numerous judo, excellent judo teachers and coaches on this, on this, this call. And my dad, and many of you know who my dad was, uh, would say that, that we are not charging enough for our knowledge and our abilities uh, to teach judo. So I just wanted to throw that out there. 
Okay, Bill, Bill Caldwell. Uh, yeah, thank you, Grace. This is uh, an excellent series and excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to, I took some notes and I wanted to reinforce what you said. I mean, if you open a judo business, you are opening a business. And uh, if, if you do that, you're going to have to be prepared uh, with certain things. And what I keyed in on is you have to be prepared to talk to your bank in bank speech. Um, they're going to want, expect you to know certain terms like cash flow or DBA or so. Um, and they're really important, especially if you're going to borrow money <laughs> from them for improvements and so forth. So I wanted to make that, um, that point. Um, the why speech, that's very, that's excellent in developing that, uh, it helps you develop your elevator pitch and, uh, and then the bank speech after that. So thanks again. Yeah, Bill, Bill, excuse me, Bill, would you uh, define uh, what you mean by the elevator speech for some people who may not have heard that term? Um, let, let's say you want money from somebody to invest in a business and you have 30 seconds in an elevator to explain why they should give you money uh, and invest money with you. Uh, that's, that's typically what's called an elevator speech. Just a short version, kind of, you know, like the gentleman talked about in terms of figuring out why you're doing something. So if I, if I want a uh, thousand bucks from Chuck Madani to, uh, to buy mats from my, or, you know, buy an underfloor for my dojo, um, why should I do that? Why, why, why should I give you a thousand bucks? You know, that kind of thing. And it has to be very brief and has to be to the point. Okay, thanks very much. Carlos Vega, you're next. You're, you're um, muted, Carlos. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, a very good presentation. I do have a, a small uh, uh, comment on the on the white of judo. Uh, uh, we uh, usually uh, uh, use all of the suggestions that uh, uh, Grace Rosman uh, 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 mentioned, but there's also something that we use very much, which is the UNESCO uh conclusion unesco which is the united nations education scientists and cultural organization uh made a study a 15 year study uh very complete and in 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 there uh, they say that judo is the best sport uh even over uh, a question in in uh, swimming for uh, uh children from uh uh three years old till uh 18 years old. So that's a, a, a very good uh, uh, point that, that we use to explain why uh, people should uh, take judo. Thank you very much. Nice presentation. Okay, thanks very much. Clayton Willett, you have a question. Hi, Grace. This is Clayton out in Oregon. Hello. Uh, I had a question about projections. Did you do those yourself or is that something you had your accountant do for you? For the one year, the three year, the ten years. I, I did it myself. I had, uh, I mean, I, I took a, a basic financial course in college, and it was like I figured rather than paying some, but it was like I mean, you just you can Google it. So, you know, you figure out what your income is, right? You know, how many students you're gonna have, uh, and it's 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 not. I I don't want to say it's made up, but I mean, I had you know. Going from an Aikido dojo where I, they were charging forty dollars a month, that was not going to be a realistic projection for me. So I had to like go square one. This is what I'm going to make. This is what I'm charging. These are how many students I have right now. This is how I plan to uh, grow every month. So this this is my one year. So it, it had like a big spike, and you, I, I I I sort of I fudged it, but I got I got the money. They just want to see that you know what you're talking about and where you're going. So there's no special tools. It was just Google and. Well, yeah, I don't want to oversimplify it, but that's basically what it came down to. Okay. You want to know that you you have a vision and what you're you're, you're going to do. So and figure out what your obviously your expenses are, and and when your break even and your profit is. So I mean, I don't want to say I made it up, but it was sort of I made it up. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Other questions, questions or comments? Helpful comments. A lot of experience on this call. Um. Anybody? Steve Akeda. Uh, yeah, 
you know, um, I'm kind of in a, a unique situation, I think. I recently inherited a dojo that I've been a member of for 50 years, but uh, uh, I've since taken over the dojo. And uh, for our entire existence, we have run on a, on a low income model where we looked at ourselves as a community service for little or no money. And I've been mulling this for several months and I think uh, uh, an email interchange that I had with Grace recently really solidified my view on it that I need to increase my dues. Um, uh, I think the, the, the rate that we're charging undervalues the product that we are putting on the mat. We, you know, we have good instructors, we put good judo out there, and right now we're babysitting kids. But what I'm kind of afraid of is what kind of pushback am I likely to see from my members as well as some of my instructors who have bought into this uh, public service model for their entire judo careers also because most of them uh, have been involved with this same club for 40 years or more. So I'm wondering with the combined wisdom of, the, of this group, what can I expect when I tell our members, we're going to go from $30 a month to 80 or 90 or $100 a month, uh, especially when they know that we don't need the money. Now, I, I do have some other plans, thanks to Grace. Uh, what I can do with that money, scholarships, grants, funding uh, camps, uh, providing judo geeks, paying tournament fees, things like that. So I can, I can do something with the money, but I am a little fearful of the pushback that I'm likely to get from parents and students who say, we've been coming here for years at $30 a month, and now you, you're, you're going to triple it. We're out of here. So I'm, I'm going to tell you the story of Ernest, and he's one of my most faithful students. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not looking. I'm looking at you, Steve, but uh, like the, the camera's up here. Okay, so <laughs> the camera's down here, but I'm looking at you up here. Um, you up here. Um, wait, so, so Ernest, he's been with me since day 30 uh, at the Aikido Dojo. And he does not have a lot of money at all. Um, he was paying $60, no, $40. Well, he had his son, so $60. And that was the cap. And we, I decided to take my, my dojo to a commercial site. And I charged, I, and then at that time we had 13 students. And I charged, so we moved over and I said, I'm gonna just bump up the price just to cover basic costs. And I know I'm gonna take a hit the first you know year or so. So I, I was uh, already set with that in my mind. Um, I charged them an extra $20. So I bumped the price up to, to $80 for a membership. And no one had a problem with paying an extra 20 bucks. And any new students who came in at the new dojo, they were charged hundred dollars. But I grant, but I made I made them the founders club, the you know the the old students the founders club. And I, my my plan was, um, as they left, because because Champagne's a very transitory town, um, so I figured, eventually the people paying hundred dollars is gonna out is gonna out you know outnumber the people who are paying that founders fee, so. Event so you know by the before the shutdown I still had um, I had lawyers come in uh, professors at the university come in and they, they were all paying a hundred dollars and you know I, I had about yet yeah, my ten members who were the founders fee eventually all the founders fees left but Ernest has stayed um, through the pandemic all my adults have left and Ernest has stayed he's the only one who is who is he's in the founders he has no he does not have a lot of money he works like two jobs and. I even told him, I was like, I don't need your money. And he was like, no, sensei, this is, you know, I believe in the dojo. This is what I'm paying. And I know you have to pay rent. Uh, so I'm just going to pay. He's the only one who's been paying. And he's like the least person who should be paying. So I don't think there's going to be too much pushback, especially if you just raise it incrementally. You might have, you know, as you said, you don't, you don't need all the money. You know, you don't need that money. So you can probably just bump up the fee because they're not going to bat an eye at $20 a year or anything like that. So... But eventually, I mean, you could do that same thing where you grant, you you have like, you know, new members are joining, they're gonna pay that $120 or whatever you're gonna charge. 
but you have the, the founder's fee and you're just going to just like stay it and incrementally maybe grandfather in them into the new prices or raise prices for the new members. I don't know what your situation is. Well, I certainly know what your situation is, but just incrementally, they're not going to bet an eye at $20 a month. You know, everyone has $20 a month they can give, right? So I, I don't think it's a, that, I mean, difficult for people to wrap their brains around. And they know that uh, you, you're, you have uh, value in your Jude. And, th and if they know what that is and they understand what it is, I think, I don't think they're going to, the, they're going to, they're not going to like really push back too much, especially if they know the direction that you're going to go with it. If, if I, if I could uh, jump in here before we get to Dr. Menzel, uh, I wanted to comment about the same thing that, uh, that Grace is just asking about or talking about, and that is, uh, about pricing and, and changing your pricing. And I follow the professional photographers literature. That's what I kind of do on the side. And uh, there's all, there are a lot of uh, articles and advice on, on um, valuing yourself and making sure that you can, you can make a profit so you can, you can you live a life so it can be a real job. And the emphasis is that or one of the emphases is that when you raise your prices, you're going to have a different clientele. You're going to lose some people. Some people will stay, but you're going to gain others. And so uh, just because you, you uh, lose a couple of your, or maybe a number of your low paying uh, students, um, uh, you're raising your prices so that you are valuing yourself and you can, you can get that extra money that you need to live a life uh, that you want to. Uh, but I think that uh, Grace's idea of grandfathering is, is a great idea uh, to, to ease that pain uh, and it's actually not really a pain, but e ease the, uh, the shock of having to pay more money. Uh, Dr. Lorenzo Menzel, you're next. Thank you. Um, so uh, to answer uh, Sensei Kubo, I would also say um, if you do it in stages, which was already mentioned, um, the grandfathering in, which was already mentioned, but you can also say that, look, you're going to be using this money for, you know, uh, swag or scholarship programs. If you explain it, I think it should be you just froze lorenzo <laughs> there you go you're back yeah my question for grace was um how, how what do you use for your marketing what media um do you use print uh, very heavily um uh, i think you've mentioned tiktok um there's some other things that i wrote down I'll show you notes. Um, but so what approaches are you taking for marketing, please? I did I, I did the paper route and it doesn't work because no one, you know, you if you put like, you know, flyers in the windshield of people's cars, that doesn't work. It sort of cheapens it. But um, uh, a lot of the print stuff doesn't work. I've done, I, that's why I said take every opportunity you can to just get your name out there. And, you know, like the and Google is, is, is so important. I, um, I, I, I spoke about Google ads, Facebook ads and um, Yelp ads. I mean, those, they're there, but it's like, you got to pay a premium to get your, your face out there. So I've used a lot of, I mean, I'm just out there on social, I'm just shilling me. I'm shilling judo, but in, in the appropriate way, um, with Google ads, Google, not, not Google, uh, Google ranking, Google blogs, Facebook postings. I'm just trying to get my name out there and I'm getting more people in as you know, kids, you know, the kids are all wearing you know, t-shirts and they're wearing them around town, town, I see them and, or you have a nice t-shirt and everyone's like, Hey, where, where do you do judo at? So a lot of it is just super grassroots. It's not, it's not putting yellow pages or anything or, or newspaper ads. Um, it's just, and then actually if you use, uh, if you have an event or uh, some, some kid got, you know, went to a tournament and won, I've, I've contacted the local newspaper cause they love that stuff. And, you know, uh, the, the schools where the kids go to, they love seeing, you know, little Johnny, a member at Countryside School has, you know, placed first in the in the national competition or whatever. And, you know, they that does well for the school and does well for your, you know, the dojo. So that that also just put just putting your name out there in whatever way you can newspapers, actually just the newspaper stories, not newspaper ads, but just doing things like that, like local like emails and demonstrations, just that's just the best advertising, of course, word of mouth. Right. Okay. Anybody else with uh, questions or comments, uh, supportive, uh, challenging, anything you want. 
And with uh, Sensei Steve, we were talking, um, if people were wondering what we were, we were emailing about, because uh, he, he's going to have this surplus of money once he puts his, um, uh, once he ups his prices a little bit. We talked about um, creating opportunities for, for kids. So going, you know, actually, you know, I don't know how hard it is to, to set up a college scholarship or an endowment fund or whatever. So if he has an extra thousand dollars a month coming in, he could put that towards uh, sending a kid to college one day, maybe. And then if people see that there's opportunity for for kids in in the in the um, in judo to attend to attend like college or get a five thousand dollars scholarship to go to college one day, I mean, parents are going to be like sending their kids over to judo because there's going to be this opportunity for them. Um, so that, I mean, that was one idea we were hashing around. I don't know how complicated it is because that was just off the top of my head. Um, we were also talking about, you know, donating stuff, you know, your extra income to a food bank because you're going to get, you know, thousand dollars a month to the food bank is going to help a lot of people. So it's using all this money uh, and, and really like, you know, emphasizing mutual welfare and benefit, not just for judo, but for the community, um, the immediate community within that's outside of your judo bubble. Okay. Other people with uh, questions or comments? Let me tell you that uh, this is the second uh, se session of this series of uh, the business of judo opening, a ch opening or reopening a club. Um, I have a friend who mentioned a few weeks ago, maybe a couple months ago, that he wanted to open a couple of dojos. And he said, there's really nothing to it. I mean, you just kind of open it. And uh, if you have the mats, then you go you're good to go. Good to go. Uh, I think that th that... Uh, approach uh, is probably not going to be held by anybody on this call or the calls that, we, that we've had before or the calls that we're going to have uh, next month. Uh, this is an incredibly complex uh, uh, set of issues in opening a business. So because as, as just recently been mentioned, it is a business and you can't just do it like uh, you're, you're, you know, you're attending the, um, uh, the swim team booster club you know, a couple of nights a week. Uh, this is serious. Uh, next time, next time is uh, going to be uh, May 23rd. Grace is going to present the third in the series, the third and last in the series. And that's going to include, let's see, that, uh, oh, there it is, Sunday, May 23rd. If you build it, they will come. And uh, uh, Grace, you want to say something about that? Here, preempt me. You know oh. how to talk about it. <laughs> I think this is what we're, so uh, we're going to be talking about building the actual dojo, finding the perfect space um, or close to the perfect space, looking over your lease, um, what to consider, what, how to outfit your dojo equipment, uh, merchandise. Uh, so you need to, you know, kids need to wear something to judo. So, you know, your uniforms, your belts, what, you know, what companies are doing that. I don't know if Chuck Wall's on this co uh, call, but it's... Uh, Judo Gear USA. He's always been a big supporter. Of course, there's uh, uh, Hitachi Sports. So that's great. Um, we're gonna go. We're, we might dive deeper down into uh, dojo management software, and we can actually do building a curriculum. Uh, maybe not sure <laughs> yet, but um, again, I mean, every everything in this this presentation is easily an hour, two hour long conversation. So I mean, whatever you want, but that's sort of like the outline of what we're doing. Okay, uh, before I uh, before I f uh, throw it back to Mitchell, I want to thank everybody for for attending and tell all your friends because you've seen this uh, you've seen two sessions now. Hopefully, you've seen two sessions, and I think that there is enough information on this for you to understand that uh, the complexity and the the seriousness that you have to take when opening a judo club is, is real. And Grace Toulousen is uh, is a great person to tell us exactly what she's been through. And I think that I've never heard anybody talk about how how to start a judo club the way that Grace has. In fact, no, nothing even come clo comes close, except there's a couple of people, uh, Chuck Jefferson, uh, Roy Kawaji, and, and some others. Uh, and we're going to have them in our, in, in our group of people who are going to continue to help at the end of this series, uh, after the series is open. But for right now, it's May 23rd for the next series, uh, for uh, session number three. And Mitch, uh, back to Mitchell Palacio, President Palacio of the USJF. Thank you, Chuck. Rodolfo, you had a question? You had your hand up, I wasn't sure. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Very quickly, since we are running out of time, just wanted to ask uh, Grace, uh, 
once you have the, the dojo available, have you considered the pros and cons uh, of filling those uh, times where the, the mat is not used by other sports, like uh, outsourcing, like the reverse way that you did with Aikido, but perhaps also a yoga class, and in a way maximize the use of the space? I have considered it, but I mean, it, it you 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 can you can obviously offer other classes. So I mean, my dream is to have build like a bigger program, so like offering like you know strength and conditioning courses, you know, a competitive team with like you know a, a session in the morning, a session in the afternoon, and then uh, you know training session at night. That's that's what I want. But I there there are times that I could bring a you know jujitsu club in or an aikido club but for me personally i don't want to do that i just want judo in my dojo so i mean it's if you want that in your dojo i mean i go go for it i mean i i, I would have no problem with it and if i if i felt it was an option i would i would get it because i have a lot of jujitsu players uh, or clubs wanting to start their own club out of my dojo and i, I just don't want to deal with them saying hey take your shoes off at the dojo and i don't want your dirty gi on my mat and why aren't why aren't you cleaning my mat i mean there's so many things that that could go wrong that i have all this control over right now and i love it i love my dojo so much but i just don't want to deal with that you know trying to get those people you know acclimated to my rules because they have their way of doing stuff because they, they walk off the mat without shoes on and into the bathroom without their shoes on and it drives me nuts and I don't want to sit there and be like sitting there at every class making sure that they do it until I feel comfortable with them. So that that's my choice, but I mean absolutely go go nuts with having aikido and karate and yoga and senior citizens programs, bingo night or whatever on your mat. I mean that that's a great way to make extra income. And we can probably talk about that next time too. Thank you, Grace. Mickey, question? Just is it uh, uh May 23rd about the same time? Yes, May 23rd at th 3 Central. So that's for Boston time. For Eastern. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Can you guys go to your reactions and uh, give the clap <laughs> or the thumbs up for grace, appreciation? Thank you all for joining. Um, again, USGF is moving in directions of. of opening new ways and new pathways for success. Uh, we will continue every month. Uh, we will have a series with mental health, uh, with teaching, coaching, um, uh, business. And also I wanna reach out to you. If you have an expertise that you want to share, uh, contact Dr. Madani or myself with my email and let me know what you, what you wanna do. What you, and we all, as I've always said, USGF is rich in, in experience. Uh, expertise and knowledge, and we're going to capitalize on all the all these things that we have. So again, thank you very much for participating and joining on this uh, workshop with Grace Tulusan. Thank you, and have a have a great year, great day. Bye, everybody. Nice seeing everybody. Bye, Mickey. <laughs>